for McGill University, but I am also uh, the director of the Max Bell School of Public Policy right there, uh, and very happy to be here. Um, and um, I, I want you all to, to, uh, to know that we very much appreciate you coming to the conference, and we also appreciate the flexibility that you have shown. Uh, this conference, as you may well remember, was originally slated to be held in April. And then this little thing called a global pandemic got in the way. And, uh, and so we delayed it until September in the hopes that we would be in person by then. But of course, we are not. So here we are. Um, I'm actually in Gimli, Manitoba. Uh, and of course, all of you are wherever you want to be with an internet connection. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, we think this topic is really important. As you know, the Bank of Canada is uh, having its mandate renewed roughly a year from now. And for the next several months, uh, this discussion, I think, will be, uh, will be live in Canada. And the, the choice for the Bank of Canada's mandate will be renewed, uh, it will be debated, uh, and the several options on the table. And we think it's just really important, and we certainly hope that this conference can help stimulate and help inform that debate. And I want to just start off by thanking Stephen Gordon, and I'm going to talk, turn to him in, a, in about a minute. But Stephen Gordon is the one from Laval University who, who approached me to see if you know, we were interested, um, and, and I'm just delighted that he did. So this conference is really all due to Stephen, uh, but I'm very happy that the Max Bell School can actually be the official host. And uh, I wish you were all in Montreal and we were in our new digs uh, on Sherbrooke Street, but we'll have to wait until the next conference. Um, let me just say, of course, that this conference is being held remotely and uh, something will almost certainly go wrong. We just don't know what will go wrong and we don't know when it will go wrong. But you will hear Stephen and myself and Andrew Potter, who will also be co-hosting, you will hear us refer to two people. Um, we will refer to Katrine and we will refer, refer to Nick. And Katrine and Nick um, are our technical wizards behind the scenes. They will be making sure that everything runs well. Um, so anyways, we're looking forward to doing this on Zoom. We've never done it before, not surprisingly, uh, but we are actually very enthusiastic about the package that we've put together. Before I turn it over to Stephen, I want you to um, participate in a little bit of a poll. So one of the things we've decided to do is we're going to run an identical poll uh, at the beginning of every day and at the end of every day. So that will be eight times. And the poll is, is really just to get a sense of where you are in your thinking about the options before the Bank of Canada. So Katrine, if I can ask you to put up the poll, that there's one question, this will take 30 seconds, maybe a whole minute, but I'd like you to identify only your top three options. Now, you may think that there are other options in front of the Bank of Canada that aren't listed here, but these are the six options that we will be discussing over the next four days. So please just click on the three options only that are your top choices. Um, and then we will, uh, we'll see what those results look like. And we will see how those results change over time. And so when this poll is done, uh, so we still need another 30 people to cast your votes, please only three choices, only three choices. Um, and then we have to make sure that we capture this in some way that Nick and Katrine will figure out. And then we will be able to compare the results over time. Now, Katrine, may I ask, is it all done now? 31 voted. So yes. there's more voting that could take place if we give you another 15 seconds. Everybody? Oh, the polls. We're gonna have to relaunch polling for that. Okay, so well, why don't we just call that as our starting point? Okay. So raising the inflation target is getting 61% of the votes. So currently we're only 31 votes. So it's a bit of a small sample, but we'll get there over the next one. Reduce is small, 
target the level of nominal GDP, adopt a dual mandate. Why is that one in red? Because it's the winner? Is that right? That's yes. what's going on. Yes. Okay. And incorporate yeah. asset price and maintain status quo. So take a look at that, folks. That's where we are at the beginning of a four half day conference. We will see at the end of today if, um, if opinions change. And we'll see again tomorrow morning after you've had a night to think about it, whether opinions have changed, and then we'll proceed that way. So without further ado, let me um, introduce Stephen Gordon, Laval economist, all round good guy, and the man who's, uh, who's absolutely responsible for bringing this idea to us, and I'm delighted that you did. So Stephen Gordon, over to you. Well, thanks, and I'm also extremely grateful to Chris and the Max Bell School people for uh, making, well, basically my, my wish a reality. So I'm uh, very excited with these people. Uh, the, the, this is a di different kind of a conference from usual, of course. Uh, the, um, we're not looking to expand uh, our under the frontiers of research here, although we're, of course we're hoping that certain you know, people will, will learn things. Uh, this is a debate that really should be happening more broadly, more generally. Pre the, uh, the existing mandate of the 2% inflation targeting has been around for more than 20 years. It's been renewed every five years without really much in the way of public discussion. That's perhaps understandable because um, if things aren't, aren't broken, you don't fix it. And so the debate about actually renewing an not uh, basically went under the radar. There would be internal consultations at the Bank of Canada, um, and the bank would make its recommendation to the Minister of Finance, and that would be adopted. And it was generally to uh, renew the existing mandate with perhaps some tweaks at the margin. Uh, that debate really should be brought at this time. I think uh, there was a missed opportunity in 2016 after the, after the in the wake of the um, financial crisis, um, other things started to be happening to be concerned. Uh, for example, the bank started to have more difficulty reaching its 2% target. Uh, and we started to have to recognize that perhaps the world in which the, uh, from which the targeting regime emerged of that of high and variable inflation um, had moved on to a, a world where inflation was low and in fact, often lower than the 2% target. Um, Complications of the financial news, uh, financial markets suggested maybe Bank of Canada or monetary policy, central banks should be doing more there. Um, the fact that the um, it became more and more difficult to reach the uh, the target suggests perhaps we should be revisiting it. And of course, maybe more recently with uh, the uh, the accumulation of a lot of uh, much very a lot of certain amount of government debt in the Bank of Canada's balance sheet um, suggests another restart. So the uh, renewing the mandate, the old mandate, might still be a very good idea. We're certainly going to give that, that's why it's still on the table. Um, but it's perhaps not the automatic renewal, the automatic slam dunk that it might have been in the past. We should be, uh, there should be more uh, broader discussion with this. And it really, it has to be done outside the Bank of Canada. The Bank of Canada is, of course, the source of a certain amount of uh, expertise, but it is not the Bank of Canada's um, power to uh, choose its own mandate. That has to come from the democratic process, and that means people outside the bank. And certainly the bank will make its recommendations, just like deputy ministers make their recommendations to ministers all the time, but the, uh, the final decision has to come from the democratic, democratic process, and that means people outside the Bank of Canada. Um, there is, of course, a certain amount of bank expertise in the Bank of Canada. There's a lot of expertise outside the Bank of Canada, and that's what we're going to be tapping into over the next four days, um, providing people with the, the basic logic, what we understand, how we understand how the economy works, whatever and evidence to bear, um, and about six options, including, of course, the, uh, the status quo. These options were chosen mainly because they've been uh, raised um, by uh, serious researchers, serious analysts in the, uh, in the community. Uh, we can't talk about everything, uh, of course. We're not going to talk about the gold standard. So that's the goal. We, we're hoping that this will be um, a reference, a um, point of reference for the broader debate going forward over the next year or so. And I'm very, very pleased that it's ongoing. So before I pass on to uh, our first speaker, just want to um, 
just let, let you know if you haven't figured out already um, your your microphone is going to be muted you won't be how you won't be able to unmute it yourself so if you have anything to say to me or to everybody or to anybody uh, use the chat um, uh, the, the chat function okay the little the chat function function is that little uh, talk talk balloon at the bottom alt h apparently and opened up the panel on the right hand side you can send messages to everybody you can send messages to me or to any a given person this is one online thing you can do is you can actually talk amongst yourselves without disturbing the speaker which is something you can't do in person um, if you go and after of course the discussion there will be a, um, a question and answer period um, could you please send let me know if you would like to ask a question i will take you know, i'll keep note of that and at the end i will announce your name and you will be unmuted and then you can uh, make uh, ask your question um we're also going to uh, experiment something and at the end of the session one of the um unsung uh, virtues of in-person conferences is the, uh, it's a chance to uh, chat with people during the intervals and uh, often very interesting conversations happen there We've set up um, a couple of coffee break rooms. And just to get the conversation started, we've asked a couple of uh, people who are reasonably well known and have, or maybe they have opinions uh, to, uh, to host these coffee breaks. Today, Angelo Molino of University of Toronto and Nick Rowe, formerly of Carleton University and famously of, of our blog, Worthwhile Canadian Initiative, uh, will be hosting two of the sessions. And if you want to stay in this uh, the main room, it will be left open and you can just chat amongst yourselves with no particular guidance. Um, now, um, I guess the next, that's the only thing. Uh, everyone will have, the present presenters will have 20, 25, 25, 30 minutes, discussions 15 or 20. I will be unmuting and, and giving a discrete warning at the 25 and 15 minute intervals just to let you know that five minutes are coming up. And without further ado, I'm going to pass along the uh, virtual podium to Luba Peterson, who is our first speaker and who will be talking about the, uh, the first option up for discussion, uh, increasing the, uh, the, the target of inflation. Okay, unmute myself. Can everybody hear me? Is that good? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, uh, well, first, let me begin by thanking Chris and Stephen for organizing this timely forum uh, to discuss the different policy options for the renewal of the Bank of Canada's um, mandate. Uh, this is an excellent time to be discussing many of these policy options and giving them serious regard. We've seen such dramatic changes in the global economy and fiscal and monetary balance sheets. And I'm very uh, proud to be able to get to contribute to this discussion. So today I'm going to be making the case for why the Bank of Canada should raise its inflation target. Um, and I'm going to present some evidence and strategies for implementing a higher target. I want to be clear that um, while I do consult for the bank, I don't, um, the, these views are to, presented today are my own and certainly don't reflect those of the Bank of Canada. Um, to begin, uh, well, nearly 30 years ago, the Bank of Canada began adopting an inflation targeting framework to guide its monetary policy. And this framework was agreed upon by the government and the Bank of Canada and is motivated by the belief that long-term economic growth can be achieved through maintaining price stability through steady inflation. Uh, the target aims to keep total CPI at the 2% midpoint of a target range of one to three percent over the medium term. So the Bank of Canada, it raises or lowers its target for the overnight rate um, as appropriate in order to achieve that target, typically within a six to eight quarter horizon. And in recent years, um, the bank has also been using quantitative easing and various communication strategies to achieve its inflation target. Canada has done exceptionally well at achieving this target. Um, and it's kept inflation within its one to 3% band for most of the last 30 years, and, and certainly within that targeted horizon of six to eight quarters. But um, during the last financial crisis, and now during this global pandemic, Canada is experiencing much lower than target inflation. And there's mounting concerns that secular stagnation is occurring in developed economies. We're seeing lower real interest rates, slowing growth, risks of deflation, and all the while this is occurring, we've got ever-increasing debt burdens. For all these reasons, central banks, including the Bank of Canada, 
are being called on to tolerate more inflation. Before I get into discussing um, why we should raise the inflation target, I first want to start off by explaining what raising the target should do in theory. Um, there's at least two channels through which the raising the inflation target would stimulate the economy. Uh, first, a higher inflation target would have a direct effect on the bank's uh, policy rate. Nowadays, in a low inflation environment, a higher inflation target would mean that the bank would be keeping interest rates relatively low for longer in an effort to achieve higher inflation. Um, that lower interest rate would make it more affordable for households and firms to borrow. Um, it would encourage uh, more spending, increase in aggregate demand, and that in turn would put upward pressure on prices and generate more inflation. But a higher inflation target would also stimulate inflation by uh, influencing the expectations of households and firms. A higher target would signal to households and firms that in the future, the bank would be willing to um, accept a higher level of inflation before raising rates. And anticipating that higher inflation, forward-looking households would in theory go out and spend more, and that would put upward pressure on prices. Firms would anticipate that their competitors would start raising prices, and so they would start doing the same when given the opportunity to do so. So now this expectations channel of monetary policy um, has the potential to generate very sizable and immediate effects um, on inflation. Now, monetary policy, in particular inflation targeting, can very, work very well when it's unconstrained. Um, but for the last decade, the bank's overnight rate has been very close to its effective lower bound. And in other words, it's had very limited scope to lower in interest rates to stimulate inflation. Instead, the bank has relied on less conventional tools like QE and forward guidance to manage expectations. Now, in selecting a policy framework, the focus should be on flexibility. The bank needs to be able to adequately respond um, in the event of either an inflationary episode, but also in a recession. Now, while the bank has certainly demonstrated its ability to stabilize markets with QE, um, having that policy rate at its disposal would reduce the strain on its balance sheets. Back in 2018, Larry Summers was advocating that central banks aim to return their policy rates to the 4 to 5% level. This would give them leeway to reduce rates in the event of a recession. Well, now we're approaching that recession and there's not very much room to move. By accepting higher inflation levels, um, the bank would be then able to justify raising the rates gradually, which then would give them scope to adjust them down in the, you know, in a recession from now. Another reason why we want to consider seriously raising the inflation target is because higher inflation is high, likely to be very likely to be inevitable. Uh, there has been an incredible amount of money pumped into the Canadian economy. The Bank of Canada's balance sheets has ballooned to over $540 billion of assets. The government has provided a vast amount of money um, or in emergency and recovery benefits to households and firms in order to keep the economy going and functioning what, decently. And much of the stimulus has gone to minimum wage earners who have the highest marginal propensities to consume. And this is all happening in an environment where we've seen relatively lower production because of this pandemic and, um, and fewer assets being created. And so simply put, we've got more dollars chasing after a limited, if not fewer number of goods. This is surely going to generate some sort of inflation. Now, unwinding this stimulus is going to be challenging. Um, we've got heavily indebted households in Canada as well as all levels of government who simply can't afford for rates to increase. It's gonna be very difficult for the Bank of Canada to rein in much inflation if um, inflation were to rise without creating insolvency issues. And at the same time, we've got the Federal Reserve in the United States who's clearly indicating their willingness to exceed 2% inflation in an effort to achieve an average inflation target of 2%. Now to avoid, so what, what does that mean? Well, that means that you know, the federal funds rate is gonna remain lower for longer. And if we wanna avoid the Canadian dollar from appreciating, we too need to follow a lower for longer strategy as well. So if higher inflation is inevitable, then it, I would argue it would be in the Bank of Canada's interest uh, 
to explicitly raise its inflation target. Otherwise, keeping the target at 2% when their policies and their neighbor's policies are clearly aimed at achieving above 2% inflation is going to confuse markets and the public and risk the bank's very hard-earned credibility. Now, um, the problem is, in considering a higher inflation target, is that the bank has never raised its inflation target. So we don't really know whether that would be well received by the public and by the markets. Uh, most countries, when they proceed with inflation targeting and they get inflation under control, uh, they tend to either decrease or main, maintain their targets. But there have been two examples that I want to talk about briefly um, where the central bank has increased their inflation targets. That's the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and the Bank of Japan. Now, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand began in inflation targeting in 1990. Um, they first began with a range of zero to 2% and actually were quite effective at bringing inflation down from well over 7% to about 2.83% within about a five year horizon. In 96, uh, they raised the up, um, or sorry, in, in 96, they raised that upper bound of their range to 3%, which effectively raised that midpoint from one to one and a half percent. And what this was accompanied with was a continued gradual decline of inflation to 1.8%. So it didn't actually stimulate in further inflation expectations. If anything, it brought inflation expectations down, but right into that midpoint of that targeted range. Then in 2003, the bank raised that lower bound um, of the range from zero to 1%. And that effectively increased the midpoint to 2%. And over that next few years, average inflation rose to 2.8%, and over the last 20 years has been roughly 2%. Now, I would take this as a very successful case of achieving um, inflation targets. And one reason why the bank has been so effective at achieving its targets is because they've been very credible. They actually, you know, accomplish their targets, but also many of, or much of their targets um, were plausible. So in recent memory, uh, the public had seen inflation in those ranges. And so it was not uh, infeasible to expect that the bank would be able to achieve its targets. Now, I wanna take another example, the Bank of Japan. Um, the BOJ has been recently experimenting with communicating an inflation target and raising that target. In 2012, uh, it announced that it would explicitly infl um, target inflation at about 1%. And this had been the implied um, inflation target before, um, but uh, since the bank had been failing to achieve that um, inflation, if anything, there was deflation, there was a need to explicitly convey this to the, to the public. In January 2013, the BOJ further increased its target from 1% to 2%. And while there had been some rapid inflation growth following that um, adjustment, inflation has basically fluctuated between 0.5 and 1%. And while raising that target has had a positive effect on inflation, it's been rather small and much smaller than intended. So that begs the question, well, why hasn't Japan's experience been more successful? And one reason may be that the public did not perceive that higher 2% target as credible when the 1% had yet to be reached. Now, it's difficult to look at either of these experiences and claim that it was the announced higher inflation target that stimulated inflation. Uh, these are both open economies and, that are gonna be influenced by foreign policy. And especially in the case of Japan, maybe part of this increase in inflation has been a, a result of foreign quantitative easing following the financial crisis. Now, the challenge is in considering any of these different policy mandates is that we lack a, a empirical evidence on how these um, mandates actually work in pra practice. Most central banks have been pursuing inflation targeting and that's what we can understand well, but um, other regimes haven't been very well um, experienced. Now, another problem is the effectiveness of many of these regimes depends heavily on the types of expectations agents in the economy form. And we have relatively few data sets that actually collect household and firm expectations over a very extended amount of time, let alone link that to their financial decisions. Um, but I want to argue that uh, experimentally gen generated data 
can fill this um, empirical gap. By going to the lab, we have the flexibility to study people in a variety of different um, market uh, and survey settings and be able to create the ideal data sets um, that would be able to allow us to either study expectation formation or decision making in response to a wide host of policies without very much risk to the Canadian economy. In, in the Bank of Canada can't just go around and toy with different monetary policy regimes for the sake of academic inquiry, but in the lab we can at very little risk. Um, now, for these reasons, the Bank of Canada has also been um, investing in the design of laboratory experiments, and they've been um, working with various regime or various kinds of platforms to study how people form expectations under uh, different monetary policy regimes and how currencies and payment systems can be developed. In econ lab experiments, typically what we do is per, um, incentivize participants to behave as the economic agents that we're interested in understanding. So typically these are subjects are being paid to behave as professional forecasters or households and firms and they're placed in realistic scenarios. Now, typically the focus in these settings is on um, understanding how behavior changes as we systematically or carefully vary um, specific um, features of the environment. So as an experimenter, I can uh, make very precise changes in the mandate or in the inflation target, the central bank's reaction coefficient or central bank communication, and observe how agents respond um, to these um, controlled variations. When it comes to monetary policy topics, most um, experimentalists focus on learning to forecast experimental frameworks, um, where groups of participants are tasked with repeatedly forming expectations about macroeconomic variables. In these sorts of virtual economies, um, participants' expectations are aggregated and used to um, used by, say, the automated households, firms, and policymakers to make decisions that in turn endogenously influence the macroeconomy. Now, the purpose of these experiments is to understand how policy and communication can influence how people view the future and how macroeconomic dynamics um, influence expectation formation. And there have been easily a dozen or more experiments around the world, including those done by the Bank of Canada, um, on monetary policy topics. And recent evidence by um, Cronin Hubert show that these human subjects in these laboratory experiments are very similar to surveyed households, firms, and professional forecasters in that they form, um, you know, um, autocorrelated forecast errors, they make large errors, and that they um, heavily weight historical information in their forecasts or in their expectations. So all this is to say that the lab can actually produce this data that would um, tell us something that is consistent with what we see in the real world. And these sorts of learned forecast experiments, as I've said, have been used uh, to understand expectation formation in a wide range of different um, topics in monetary policy. And I'm always happy to discuss this after, um, during the question and answer period or on the break. What I wanna do today though, is discuss the Bank of Canada's own experimental horse race. I've been working together with um, researchers at the bank, Elena Kostashina and Jing Yang, um, to understand how the different mandates that the Bank of Canada is considering um, influence expectation formation and macroeconomic stability. And we've developed an experimental test bed of five different uh, types of mandates to understand how people would respond to these different regimes, both in normal times and at the ELB. So to do this, we create a virtual economy where participants are tasked with simply making forecasts about inflation and output. They do this as they observe historical data evolve on their screen, endogenously in response to their own submitted or the economy's expectations. Uh, they see information from the central bank about the type of policy that's being conducted. In this case here, you can see um, the central bank's pursuing an an inflation target and so they see the, that target presented on their screen and they do this repeatedly over a number of periods. Um, now in the background um, we have to uh, provide some underlying data generating process for the economy. We choose one where 
that is modeled very much um, in the same way that uh, with the same sort of frameworks that the Bank of Canada is using, a simple New Keynesian model. This is a lot simpler than the frameworks that the bank is using, but it gets at the same um, general ideas and, and dynamics. Here, what's going to drive the economy are a number of things. Shocks to the economy, individuals are forming. Um, or rather aggregate expectations. And um, subjects play this game for about 50 periods. After about 20 periods, we engineer a recession. And that the economy is basically experiencing an, a significant negative demand shock that's intended to push interest rates to their effective lower bound. And our interest is in understanding how the different mandates work to stabilize the economy. Now, across different groups of participants, um, we, um, we expose different, different groups to different policy rules or um, different policy mandates. Um, these policy rules are parameterized to minimize the central bank's loss function. Now, under rational expectations, the policy rule that should come out ahead and provide the most stability is price level targeting. It should outperform inflation targeting. Um, and, you know, I won't get into a, why that is the case. Uh, Steve Ambler is going to be discussing that tomorrow. Um, but um, when we take these different policy rules to the lab and um, study them across various different groups of <clears throat> participants, what we find is that actually inflation targeting and dual mandates work very well and they work the best to manage expectations. In contrast, history-dependent mandates, which outperform when agents are rational, <clears throat> actually don't perform so well when you put humans in, in um, these sorts of economies. They result in significantly greater volatility because they encourage a more trend-chasing forecasting heuristic. Now, I'm going to present you the results from these different um, experiments. I'm going to order them in terms of stability from the most stable to the least. Hmm. So, um, what you see here are the dynamics of output and inflation over the course of these games. Each line is representing an individual or an independent economy populated by an independent group of participants. And as you can see here with the dual mandate, inflation stays very stable. When the economy is shocked into the ELB in around period 20, um, it quickly recovers and we barely see any deflation in any of our economies. Now, when we instead consider inflation targeting, um, we see very similar dynamics, albeit a considerably larger recession on impact of the demand shock. And this is because the central bank isn't focused enough on output gap stability. And as a result, this results in more unanchored output gap expectations and consequently output and inflation but by and large, IT does pretty decently, especially uh, when you compare it to the following or the remaining three different policy mandates. Things get worse when we move to history dependent mandates where the central bank has to respond to past economic variables. Um, in the case of average inflation targeting, um, where the central bank is responding to average inflation over the last four quarters, um, we see much more volatility and heterogeneity in expectations, and this leads to more unstable dynamics. The remaining two mandates, nominal GDP level targeting and uh, price level targeting, involve the central bank trying to achieve a targeted level. Um, and if the central bank fails to achieve that target, it needs to engineer more inflation or output in the next period to get back to target. And what we see is that this produces much more serial correlation and expectations, much more unanchored expectations as participants are confused as to what this means for inflation. Um, as we shock the economy into the ELB, because subjects are confused about this scenario, they tend to rely on historical information to formulate their forecasts. And um, as they see the economy moving further and further away from its you know, mandated target, they become more pessimistic and start forming more extrapolative pessimistic expectations. And that leads to deflationary spirals. We see very similar dynamics when we consider price level targeting. 
volatility is considerably higher than what was seen in the inflation targeting and dual mandate treatments when the economy is away from the ELB. And then when we shock the economy into the um, zero lower bound, um, expectations again become very pessimistic um, as a fa central bank fails to achieve its targets and the economy ex experiences worsening deflation. Now, these are all very extreme results in a laboratory setting. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that these occurred in a, in a relatively simplistic economy. If people have a simplistic economy where they have full information about how the economy is structured and how monetary policy is meant to influence um, the economy. Now, if people have difficulty forming rational expectations in this very easy game, it would be difficult to imagine that they can understand monetary policy and how it should influence the economy in a more complex environment or in, a, in the real world where there's so many moving parts. So then that begs the question, why does, it, why does inflation targeting work so much better? And the reason is simple. It's because it's simple to communicate and simple to understand. In our game, the target was set at 0%, but 2% or 4% inflation would not be materially different. Um, because it's easy to understand, it serves as a very effective anchor for participants' expectations. And once expectations are well anchored, um, the economy itself becomes more stable, which has a self-fulfilling effect. Agents anticipate more stability, and so they form more stable expectations. But history-dependent targets don't do well for the same reasons. Um, first, um, in, in the case of, say, price-level targeting, uh, the target is communicated in terms that are different from what the subjects themselves are actually forecasting. It's not easy for a participant to understand what a price level of, say, 100 or 1,000 should mean for their inflation forecasts. Also, um, when we move to history-dependent targets, uh, there is more scope for credibility loss. If the central bank's falling short of its price level target, it needs to engineer more inflation to, in the next periods to get back to target. Now, it can be difficult for participants or agents in the economy to believe that more inflation is around the corner when the central bank has failed to achieve inflation in the recent periods. So in other words, um, mandates that require reacting to past um, in, you know, deviations from target are going to demand significantly more forward-lookingness, more credibility, and more rationality to be successful. Five more minutes, Luba. Yeah. Well, five? Okay. Now, so I've been making the case for um, a constant inflation target, um, but, you know, we haven't in the lab in this sort of environment looked at um, raising the inflation target. But um, I have done some work looking at how people would respond in overlapping generation economies where people are making, um, making consumption and saving decisions as well as forming expectations about inflation. So with one of my PhD students, Ryan Rolls, um, we've been um, studying expectation formation in response to secular stagnation. In this environment, um, after a number of periods, we shock the economy with a very permanent deleveraging sh um, shock, basically a very significant demand shock. Um, after some further time, uh, the central bank raises the target from 10 to 30 percent. And that's a very extreme scenario, but it's, um, we show such a wide, uh, significant increase for, of that target for demonstrative purposes. And our interest was understanding is, is can you know, raising the inflation target actually stimulate inflation expectations and encourage more spending? And in short, what we find is that um, it's very difficult to achieve that higher inflation target. Here I have um, inflation time series for two independent economies. And um, we find that we can very quickly coordinate these economies on the 10% inflation target at the beginning of the game very well. When we shock the economy with this deleveraging shock, inflation begins to fall. And um, in some cases, we experience considerable deflation. And after the central bank intervenes by raising the inflation target, we see one of two types of scenarios happen. In this session four, we see expectations slowly creep up to zero as subjects look for an anchor to coordinate their expectations on, very far away from that new inflation target. 
In other cases, um, we see that you know, the economies try to move toward that higher inflation target, but they fall short, become pessimistic about the central bank's ability to achieve that higher target, and um, slowly devolve into a deflationary spiral. Okay. Now, in practice, the Bank of Canada would never raise their targets so dramatically, but what these experiments highlight is that, is that there are risks associated with raising a target too aggressively. So I wanna just conclude with some strategies that the bank may wanna consider um, when implementing a higher inflation target. The first and most obvious is to go slow and maintain credibility. Raising the target too much and too fast is likely to be met with skepticism, as we saw in the case of Japan and in my experiments. If the bank wants to pursue a midpoint target of say 3%, um, it may wanna demonstrate its ability and willingness to accept such levels of inflation. Um, younger Canadians have not had experience with higher inflation levels and they're going to need to see it to believe it. One way to do that is to operate within the existing mandate of, of inflation targeted in the one to three percent range. In the short run the bank could maintain its existing policy target while inflation creeps up. As it comfortably approaches that three percent the bank could then adjust its targeted range to say two to four percent um, with 3% as that focal midpoint. But if you don't adjust that range soon enough, then people are going to start anticipating that the bank will be responding in, to this um, higher than normal inflation and may form more pessimistic inflation expectations. Also, the bank may want to revisit some of your inflation statistics. There's always debate as to whether the stats can CPI measures adequately capture shelter and food costs. Um, inflation of say three percent might not seem so unrealistic uh, to Canadians who are living in you know cities like Toronto and Vancouver that have had persistently high price growth and indeed the pandemic has you know has created substantial inflation in certain consumer goods the silver lining to that is that um, it could normalize a higher level of inflation moving forward and last I just want to say that communication is going to play a very important role in achieving um, a higher inflation target. Um, we take for granted that the public understands and cares about what the bank is up to. Um, the more aware Canadians are about the inflation that's ahead of them, the more likely these targets are going to be reflected in wage and price contracts and become more normalized in the economy. Uh, inflation projections can also work very well to guide expectations. And last, um, raising this target is not going to come without some objections. Low income and financially excluded households are likely to bear the brunt of this higher inflation. Um, the banks should be working with financial organization, education organizations and consumer financial agencies to help these populations identify the types of assets that would help to shelter them from some of these costs of inflation. And it's also important as moving away from a 2% target to something higher that the bank convey to the public why they're doing this, why this is necessary, so as to deflect some of these objections and to um, help to preserve the bank's credibility. Okay, all right, so I'll wrap up there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. that was great. Uh, okay, we have a discussion from uh, Mick Devereaux from the Vancouver School of Economics. Uh, just pass on to Mick. To Mick. Okay, um, uh, are my slides visible now or? Yep, so I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you a five minute warning in 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Chris and Stephen, and uh, every uh, everyone organizing this for the invitation. It would be nice to be in Montreal, but I'm sitting in my living room in Vancouver. Uh, so, um, so let me kick off. Uh, this is uh, really an excellent uh, review paper. Um, I am um, not going to be able to give uh, full credit to uh, Luba for all the work that she has done with co-authors, uh, not, not having much of a, an, um, an insight into the, this new research agenda. Uh, so uh, my discussion is going to be you know, more kind of broad um, with, uh, I'm going to be revisiting uh, some of the questions that Luba uh, discusses, but not in detail about the uh, um, 
the mechanics of the uh, the experimental um, uh, procedures that, that Luba does. So this really is a, a big question for the Bank of Canada, and uh, in fact, in all inflation targetings. And you know, just to set the scene, I would say up till 2006, inflation targeting was seen as like almost the holy grail for monetary policy. Um, but now many central banks are really struggling to come up with new models or new ways to raise the effectiveness of monetary policy. And I think, you know, the key flaw that we all see in this is that um, up until, you know, the mid 2000s, uh, no one really uh, thought of the effect of lower bound as, uh, as a real constraint on monetary policy. And even after the great financial crisis, we had, um, you know, some skepticism as if this would, uh, would, would be a really uh, long, long uh, issue problem. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Fred Mishkin from 2011, suggesting that, uh, that shocks uh, such as the GFC would occur uh, at most every 70 years. Uh, so now we're in uh, 2020 and we're back at the effect of lower bound much more globally than even uh, in 2008, 2009. Uh, so, you know, obviously we have n much new challenges for monetary policy. And really the question is how to respond, not just now, but how to plan for the future in a world economy that is likely to be uh, permanently altered by this global pandemic in, in many ways. Um, so I'm going to organize my comments in, the, in, in this way. So I'll briefly summarize the argument for higher inflation um, and particular focus on or store, what we call the neutral interest rate. Where is this going? Uh, you know, discuss a little bit the benefits and the costs based, based on, you know, the type of modeling that is done in the bank and, and uh, that Luba discussed. Um, then I'll ask, you know, if we're convinced that uh, we should raise the inflation target, how to do it, working through the expectations channel, the problem of communication, I'm going to, you know, briefly comment on uh, the question of whether we've got it backwards, whether, you know, we should raise interest rates in order to raise the inflation rate. I'll comment a little bit on the, uh, you know, the LSAPs and the current Bank of Canada responses. Uh, talk about inflation measurement and at the end I want to finish off talking about some uh, international dimensions of the question. Uh, so this is what uh, uh, we call the, the natural or neutral real interest rate. This is a measure for advanced economies. We see that it's fallen from you know around three uh, three percent in the 80s and early 90s to around half a percent now. Now this is I want one of the key issues that raises the challenge for monetary policy because uh, if we have a two percent inflation target, it implies in normal times. Uh, nominal rates would be no more than about two and a half percent. Whereas in previous recessions, uh, policy rates began much higher. So we had a much bigger cushion uh, to stimulate the economy in return in response to bad shocks. With effective lower bound, we really don't have much room to respond. So what are the options you know, uh, for monetary policy in, 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 the, um, in face of these constraints? Well, there's basically three options that are, are bandied around by the profession. There's forward guidance, which is really promising lower for longer. Now, this really depends on nebulous expectations effect. Uh, many recent authors have uh, questioned the value of forward guidance. Plus, forward guidance is not really all that useful if we're in essentially a, a, a very low uh, neutral real interest rate for a very, very persistent uh, period. We're, we're essentially going to be stuck with low interest rates forever. Uh, so for, forward guidance is, is not really uh, uh, you know, a, a, a way out for that. We have QE, uh, quantitative easing. Now, there's a lot of debate about the value of QE. It really works through ill-defined portfolio effects, and it may be hard to exploit successfully. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of literature on this, but I think the evidence is still not clear. Um, now, the, the third one, uh, which is kind of straightforward, is just raise the inflation target. That if we raise the inflation target, eventually we'll get to higher uh, policy rates to, to um, uh, 
uh, to, will give the central bank a lot more cushion in bad times. Now, this has been argued uh, uh, well before the pandemic by uh, Blanchard, by Larry Summers, by Larry Ball and others, that we should have an, an inflation target of three or four percent. Um, so at the same time, though, higher inflation is costly. I mean, we all learned that inflation has costs. So there is a trade off. Uh, there's a trade-off between reducing the frequency of hitting the uh, effective lower bound versus the cost of a higher target. Now, I just want to kind of uh, briefly uh, mention uh, some of the empirical or some of the, um, the academic work on this. There's a very nice paper by Galley and others in the Brookings 2019, which is a quantitative evaluation of the benefits versus the costs of raising the inflation target in a new Keynesian model. Uh, here's the model. I'm not going to kind of uh, go over the model, but it's basically the same model that Luba mentioned in her experimental work. Now, uh, in this case, the, uh, the benefits versus costs uh, really depend upon uh, the neutral interest rate. Uh, if we're, we have a positive neutral interest rate always, then it's the case that monetary policy is always effective and the optimal inflation is zero. We see we reach the, the lower end of the loss function at zero inflation there. Um, uh, however, if we periodically have a, a negative real interest rate or a negative neutral interest rate, the target inflation rate, the optimal inflation rate, which trades off the cost versus benefits will start to go up. And the lower uh, the neutral real interest rate, that is the more negative uh, the neutral real interest rate uh, becomes in response to, to periodic shocks, the higher the inflate, the optimal inflation target. So there is a real trade-off cost versus benefits. Uh, and this is the logical uh, argument for a higher inflation target. Uh, it gives us more cushion in response to these periodic uh, events. And of course, the more likely it is we have these uh, negative neutral interest rate shocks, the higher the inflation target should be in this model. Now, let me comment though on the costs of inflation. Now, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the kind of benefits of inflation targeting and the benefits of, uh, of kind of lower and stable inflation. Um, in new Keynesian models, the inflation predicts very high welfare costs. And that is kind of very well established now in the academic literature by Calvo, Woodford, and other, others. And the inflation costs are due to the, the dispersion in relative prices. Some firms have high prices, some low prices uh, with a time-dependent uh, pricing. We have this dispersion, which can be very costly, theoretically. Now, the evidence, uh, some new evidence by uh, Nakamura and Steinson has suggested that this kind of price dispersion is actually very weak. We don't really see it very much in the data. So uh, let me just leave the question there. I would say that the costs of relatively low rates of inflation, you know, moving say from two to three to 4% are still theoretically elusive. So, you know, while in these new Keynesian models, uh, we really want very low inflation because of these price dispersion costs. I would question, you know, whether there, there really is a big cost of moving to three or four percent inflation uh, based on these models. Uh, now, let me kind of discuss a little bit more directly uh, Luba's paper. Uh, you know, it, this is mainly focused on the means to attain a higher target. Uh, now, two decades ago, this question would have seemed kind of trivial. Why, you know, why can't we have higher inflation? You know, monetary policy prints money and causes inflation, you know, in a Friedman type way. But the experience of target undershooting in many countries, not so much in Canada, but recently, I guess, in Canada, but in many other countries, has really made this a key concern. So one of the issues is credibility. Can we get to 4% or 3% when often we miss 2%? Um, now, the Bank of Canada's record is better than other ITs. Uh, but let me point out one kind of issue that would be a really big issue, uh, big question for communication. Um, to push target inflation higher, we need policy rates lower for longer. But the objective is to get rates higher. So eventually, 
uh, we will have higher uh, nominal policy rates because that gives us more cushion, but we want lower policy rates now. And how do you communicate that to the public? Let me just uh, show you when I took this model that I just mentioned, and I looked, uh, I, I just hit the model with a shock which increases the inflation target. We see in the upper left-hand panel there, inflation goes from zero to 1%. This is just a normalization here. But look at the, the bottom left-hand panel. The way to get that working is first to lower rates and then to raise them. So this, I, I think, is a communication problem that you know would not be too easy to, to um, communicate to the public that, you know, you want to keep rates low in order for them to be high eventually. Okay, yeah, five, let me five just, minutes, five minutes, okay. Let me just kind of mention, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a heretical uh, um, uh, group in the profession that questioned this whole view about, you know, keeping rates, uh, keeping policy rates low in order to uh, stimulate the economy. There is uh, this group called the, the what they call themselves, the neo fisherians you know, including John Cochran, Steve Williamson, and others, uh, arguing that the failure to achieve target inflation may be actually the consequence of low interest rates. Uh, and, you know, in some sense, the example from the, in the paper from Japan seems to provide a little bit of evidence for that. So the question is, could we achieve higher target inflation simply by raising policy rates? Now, I'm kind of skeptical of this, but, uh, and I think many in the profession are, but, but I think it is a, a, a concern that's related to my previous point that eventually we do want higher rates. You know, that's the whole, the, the, the whole reason why we want to target higher inflation. Uh, Current Bank of Canada COVID responses. Now, Luba mentioned this pressure coming from the Bank of Canada's balance sheet expansion. And we see this enormous expansion of uh, the balance sheet and uh, where we got it here. Uh, you know, uh, the balance sheet is filled up with uh, T-bills, with Government of Canada bills, repos and everything. Um, so the paper suggests that this will increase the pressure for inflation. Uh, now, I think there's good reason to think that, but let me just point out that uh, inflation forecasts, uh, private forecasts, or consensus forecasts have not budged despite the higher shock. Uh, this is, you know, quite, um, uh, quite remarkable, I think. So there's, it's not clear that, you know, the market expects higher inflation. But even so, I think there are multiple risks associated with this. This risk of fiscal dominance if government primary deficits aren't, aren't stabilized. But also, I think there's another kind of risk. You know, uh, if this balance sheet expansion, the LSAPs, the QE, is deemed ineffective, uh, and you know, I think there's a lot of questions about its effectiveness. Uh, this may worsen the Bank of Canada's credibility. Um, and you know, I, uh, the um, uh, uh, let let me jump to the. Oh, I'm jumping. Uh, let me jump. I have uh, little time left. Um, the question is how to change expectations. Uh, you know, if we're convinced that we need a higher uh, inflation target, go from two to three or four percent. Uh, how, to, how to get there? Now, a lot of um, Luba's work, I think, is you know has uh, really kind of focused in on this key issue, which I think is very important. And the problem with these basic new Keynesian models is uh, they're kind of useless in answering this question. In the experiment I just looked at, I just raised pi bar, the target rate, and everyone knew immediately that that was the higher target rate. Um, we need a lot more evidence on how expectations are formed and how to shift them effectively. And that's why I think this, uh, the, uh, this, this whole um, uh, research program that Luba and others are working on is very, very informative. Um, the current Bank of Canada focus, you know, uh, given the, uh, the recent uh, speech made by uh, uh, Governor Macklem, I think is, is very welcome that we need kind of more direct communication, more uh, feedback from the public about what they, they, they think about uh, the bank's uh, policy and the bank's targets. Let me, though, um, raise a big caveat uh, about this. 
you know, one of the great successes of the Bank of Canada over the last 20 years has been, you know, a very kind of firmly grounded expectations. Uh, we have, uh, I just showed you the picture of uh, inflation expectations hovering around 3%. The question is, do we want expectations to be very responsive to policy? I, I'm not sure. You know, I, I, I'm an international economist, and I think back to, you know, the 19th century, the gold standard. One of the, you know, one of the factors that was really important in the success of the gold standard was that people's expectations about the policy rate, the parity rate, were really grounded. They were fixed. Now, one of the risks, I think, uh, in moving away from the 2% target and increasing the inflation target is to unhinge expectations. Let me just leave out there. Uh, I don't have time to talk about measurement issues, but I think that is important. Um, uh, Luba mentioned that. Uh, my colleague, uh, Erwin Dewert, has uh, argued that, you know, uh, the pandemic shock has really changed um, the the uh, the uh, weights in um, in CPI measurement. I think this is an important issue for the future. Uh, let me finish uh, in my last minute or 30 seconds or whatever uh, to, to talk about some kind of international dimensions. Now, you know, I think that a big challenge for the next, you know, who knows how long, many years coming out of this pandemic will be the, the problems of international coordination of monetary and fiscal policy. Now, the question is, could the Bank of Canada raise its target rate, say, to 4%, while the US and other jurisdictions keep uh, there is a 2%? I doubt this. Uh, this would imply a policy differential of 200 plus basis points once we get to you know, the target range. And this would risk unleashing carry trade pressures on the Canadian dollar you know, with, with policy rates much higher. More generally, you know, if we look at uh, uh, evidence from Ellen Ray and others, uh, we point out that there's a very high, con high correlation of policy rate changes across advanced economies. Uh, the question is, can we step out of line or would we step out of line? You know, uh, my point here is that we are operating in a, in a global financial market. And so this question cannot be posed uh, simply um, uh, uh, ig ignoring that, that dimension. And the final point I'd say is that, you know, uh, post-pandemic, uh, the future is, is very, very uncertain. Inflation quiescence, which we've had, you know, for at least 15 years now, can be partly ascribed, I would say, to globalization, to the rise of China, China and trade. Are we seeing globalization in reverse now? I think there's a lot of evidence. We've had the atrophying of WTO, the risk of beggar thy neighbor trade policy and post-COVID global system, I think is very real. Uh, let me just leave the question out there. What are the implications for inflation pressures? Uh, I think they, they may be important. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, overall, uh, you know, this is a very stimulating paper. It, it, um, it gave me a lot of um, uh, ideas to, to think about. And uh, I thank uh, Luba and thank the audience for their attention. So. Okay, Mick, thank you very much. Uh, that's, this is really going really well for me, uh, as far as I can say. Um, okay, we have some people who have uh, intervened on the chats. So that's a place to let me know if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, the first one up, uh, first one who popped up is uh, Steve Ambler from UCAM. And um, I'm just going to give the, uh, um, the organizers a second to unmute his mic. And just a little heads up, the next question will be from David Andalfato, so maybe, maybe we'll unmute him as well. Okay, so Steve Ambler, when uh, when you're ready. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for a great talk, Luba. I have a couple of questions actually to uh, related to your simulation model that you use in your lab experiments. The first one, and it relates to my talk tomorrow, where I'll be mostly talking about uh, nominal GDP targeting, is do you have supply shocks in the model at all? Um, and a, a second question would be. Um, do you allow for what, what would be the equivalent of central bank communications during the game that you play? So if you're at the zero bound, say, I know it's hard for people to understand the, the gap in the level of, of prices if you're, if you're looking at a PLT framework, uh, but if you allow the central bank to say, well, we've been at the zero bound now for two quarters, that means to get back to, uh, to target, 
within our horizon of eight quarters, the inflation rate is going to have to go up to 3% for in the interim. And that, that would actually uh, help to rather than to, to rather than have people fall into this sort of uh, morass of pessimism, as I think you sort of called it, to that would actually allow the central bank to influence uh, expectations as the game was being played. Thanks. So, I'll um, just yeah, I, I, first, let me just say, so we, our original intention was to include supply shocks along with demand shocks, but supply shocks are incredibly difficult for participants to understand. And um, the reason is because, um, because inflation and output gap move in opposite directions um, when you have a supply shock um, and a monetary policy response to it. And uh, that can in itself lead to very unstable dynamics. And uh, even before we shock these economies into the ELB. So for our, as a starting point, we focused on demand shocks only, but um, certainly the supply shocks contribute to um, the ability of um, these other mandates to do better. And so that's something that we're gonna do in, in subsequent work. Regarding your question about the central bank communication, so we haven't done that yet in this series of experiments, but I have some earlier work with Yasmina Ripovich where we um, studied inflation, um, basically price level targeting with uh, various types of central bank communication to supplement subjects, uh, under, supplement the monetary policy and improve participants' understanding of um, the mandate. Um, and we find that communication, if you is is very difficult for subjects to understand. So in those earlier experiments, um, we had participants forecasting inflation and output, but they were being presented with an, um, a, a price level target uh, as an evolving inflation target. So they were communicating in the same variables to participants so that they could at least kind of get a, an effective price anchor or inflation anchor to manage their expectations. And that didn't work very well to manage their, them. What we're thinking of doing in this project um, is uh, provide subjects with um, inflation projections to help coordinate their expectations. Um, but again, you've got to teach these participants how to coordinate their expectations on these projections before um, shocking them into the ELB when things become unstable. So. Um, but we haven't given up on these price level targeting and nominal GDP targeting regimes yet, but um, we think that the, the key way to kind of get subjects to understand this is give them simple to understand information like a, a projection. Okay, um, thanks uh, Steve. So David Andolfado is on deck and following will be uh, Dennis Zafoa. Um, Zafoa, I'm sorry, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong but the organizers, if you can put uh, his last name starts NSA. So David. Thanks, Steve. Hey, Luba, great to see you again. Uh, great talk too. I mean, I think if uh, my takeaway from your talk is that you've, you've pretty much convinced me, uh, or at least the talk seemed to be designed to convince somebody about the merits of say inflation targeting over level targets. That's, I, I really took that to be a, a forceful argument. Uh, but not necessarily an argument for raising the target, but for adopting an inflation target. Uh, but partly that's because I'm, I'm, I'm more of a, I don't see the effective lower bound as being a problem. Uh, I, I, I think fiscal policy has a, a role to play at that, at that point, but that's a separate issue. Uh, the one thing that struck me, uh, and Mick, I thought you gave an excellent discussion. Great to see you too. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about what, what is it potentially that makes um, these inflation targets credible? And, and one thing that struck me was it was precisely because uh, of the involvement of the Ministry of Finance. This is a joint venture. I mean, the, the basically the, the, the government has to sign off on this as well. So if you, if you come, on, uh, come at the question uh, as the way I do, and I, I ultimately think inflation is a fiscal phenomenon myself. Uh, but the very fact that you have the government signing on to this program is perhaps one thing that lends credibility to the regime. Um, now, um, so I, I believe that if Luba, if, you, if we wanted to raise the inflation target in Canada, I think it would be possible precisely because the fiscal authority would sign on and let the fiscal deficits run until we got the inflation up to where we wanted to. Uh, 
Uh, there is the question of uh, why this might not have happened in Japan. I think Nick might, might note that uh, both the Ministry of Finance and the DOJ announced a joint venture, I think it was in 2013, to raise the inflation target. But that was very different because what happened there was while they jointly uh, uh, announced the desire to raise the inflation target, the government of Japan uh, promptly went on an austerity program started like raising the sales tax. And they, so the, <clears throat> the fiscal authority did the opposite of what was to, needed to, to raise inflation. In Japan, the BOJ was of course powerless because it was basically swapping zero interest uh, reserves for zero interest JGBs. Um, this, this idea that Nick, uh, you know, viewing this question through the lens of the New Keynesian model, I think we have to stop it, toss that model. This idea of keeping the interest rate low to generate high inflation. No, you don't have to do that. Just tell the fiscal authority to cut taxes, cut taxes, increase, increase transfers, the inflation will come. And uh, I think that's how you do it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Any comments? Um, I, I, my, I made a mistake. The next person on, on, for the, on the question list is uh, Nariana Kartelakota, if he's available. And if you can unmute his mic, please. Nick, Katrina. You should be unmuted. Oh, I'm unmuted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, apologize. Yeah, I thought that was a great session. Uh, really got a lot out of uh, both Luba's talk and, and Nick's discussion. I had a, um, a comment and I guess two comments. So my first comment is just about the language of the central bank having more room to operate in a recession when, um, when the inflation target is higher. Uh, I know you know. I know you know uh, what you're communicating when you uh, what you're trying to communicate when you say that. Unfortunately, uh, when the public hears that, the response is, "Why don't you just raise rates to five percent? Then you'll have that extra room. Uh, who cares about the inflation target? Just maintain high interest rates." Um, I think the you know what what we're really trying to do is figure out how to get rates to be real rates, real interest rates to be low when we're at the effective lower bound. And the hope is that by having a higher inflation target, expectations of inflation will be higher in that when we're at the effective lower bound and the real rate will be lower and that'll generate more, uh, more demand. Um, so I, I think it's, this is just a, a language issue, it's a slight nuance of language. But it leads into my next comment, which is, boy, this is a lot of interesting uh, research and thinking going on about how to manage expectations. But there's another tool available, um, which is the effect of lower bound itself. Um, as uh, you know, we get into a more digital world, it seems more and more plausible and possible for central banks to switch to currency forms that are um, much more digital in nature. So you, you might maintain a very small amounts of denomination, small denominations in terms of physical currency, but most, uh, you can think about central bank accounts for individuals that the central bank could then go very negative in terms of interest rates. Uh, that will take care of all of the problems that we're talking about here are really being driven by taking as given as technological, the notion that um, there's physical currency out there that prevents the, the, uh, the, uh, lower, the interest rates from going, going below zero or much below zero. Um, so I guess one way to frame this as a question <laughs> as well as a comment is to suggest to, I'd be really interested in, in, uh, uh, in an experimental design that would take into account the possibility of, uh, of going negative with rates and, and how that would play into people's I've done um, it. reactions. Ah. Yeah, so, and it works beautifully. Um, you just have to be, and what happened, um, so we did this in the secular stagnation experiment where we um, had people making consumption saving decisions. And when you allow interest rates to go negative, people's, uh, bank accounts shrink as they realize they're not spending their money. And so this really propels them to get out and spend more. And once they do that, inflation starts rising and, um, uh, and, and that for, uh, results in them forming and leads them to form more inflationary expectations. And that really can help pull the economy out of a secular stagnation. But then you've got the risk of, well, what if people were to just move their money out of bonds um, and into cash where they can avoid those negative interest rates. And we're just about to run that experiment, but 
I don't yeah, know. I, I, but what we, but um, in those experiments, we we allowed interest rates to move very flexibly, mm -hmm. and so they dropped about negative fifteen percent, but la only stayed there for a very limited amount of time. So, but that worked very well. Cool. Thanks. Uh, next, the question is from Dennis Safoa. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, good. Thanks, Kevin. Um, my question is to Luba. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was great. Um, I'm a PhD student from University of Calgary. Um, my question is, in your experiment, did you allow for quantitative easing at the zero lower bound, at the effective lower bound? How, do your, how would your results have changed if the central bank was equipped with QE as part of its toolkits? And within the new Keynesian, simple new Keynesian framework you use for your experiment, how would you have generated the data um, for QE in your experiment? Okay, so in these simple kind of learning to forecast experiments, uh, the way you'd introduce QE is it, it would just be an additional term in say the demand curve. Um, and you'd make the assumption that QE would have an effect. So there aren't really any trading of assets going on um, in that sort of, platform or framework. Um, but it's very much like a fiscal intervention or any helicopter drop of money. We've seen that when you, uh, so with some of my earlier work with Yasmina Rifovich, we did a fiscal intervention and that works very well to kind of stimulate inflation expectations because what it does is it immediately stimulates demand and that in turn propels inflation expectations to become more optimistic and it helps to reduce the time at the ZLB. But you could do QE in a kind of more of a production environment where you've got assets and um, influence the, um, the market rates in those environments. Um, but I guess what would play into this, um, or the effects of QE would very much depend on how, um, I guess risk averse lenders were um, about the state of the economy and how, um, and whether they would like to pass those um, lower rates on to uh, consumers and borrowing firms. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. And the next question is from uh, Sylvain Leduc. Hi. Hi, Luba. Uh, great talk, a great, great conversation here. Uh, I have a question on communication. It's going to touch a little bit on uh, on what Narayana just raised and, and also uh, Mick in this uh, discussion. So as you know, the Federal Reserve just changed its long run policy framework uh, a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, in San Francisco, we've been trying to explain to the more general public how, you know, how the, the policy works. And it's been pretty challenging in terms of inflation and overshooting and and the benefit of higher inflation. And I think part of it is, is exactly the problem that uh, they have to basically understand the Fisher equation, how expectation leads to higher, how higher inflation expectation in the long run would lead to higher nominal rates and then you have more policy space. But for most people, that's, that's a lot to swallow. That's not so easy to, to convey that. And so I was wondering in terms of your, your lab experiments, if you've conducted experiment where the information for household is sort of limited or it is at least a limited understanding. But what may be more important is if, if you can really uh, communicate, communicate clearly with market participants so that they get the market pricing right. And so that household indirectly can react to that maybe along the lines of, of, uh, of central bank objectives. So even though they may have an imperfect understanding of how the economy really works and how inflation works and how inflation expectation feeds into nominal interest rates, they react to market pricing, you know, in, in a way that is consistent with the central bank objective. Um, so trying to link the market and household consumption saving decisions you'd want some sort of production economy plus an asset market kind of laboratory environment. These learning to forecast experiments are not well equipped for that, but um, I have done work with um, uh, these sorts of production and frameworks where we do do asset inflation targeting as well in there and subjects only have a qualitative understanding of the structure of the economy. Um, People learn very well monetary policy just by engaging in the environment and seeing that inflation stays stable. But I think it'd be very interesting to then, you know, have a more informed group of participants who playing in the financial markets 
who can, you know, through their decision, send signals to the public, to the public, or through implicitly um, through their investing decisions, um, and see how that man it helps to manage less informed mm -hmm. individuals' expectations and decisions. Um, but there's definitely scope to do that. Um, and also to actually bring real financial market participants into these games and see how they handle this information differently mm -hmm. than others. Thank you. Okay, um, Chris Reagan has a, has a question. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Luba, and thank you, Mick. Uh, great session to kick this all off. Um, my question is uh, related to what Sylvain just asked. It's about communication. So I guess I have a, a question or a comment about how to communicate how to get to higher inflation, which relates to something Mick said. And the second is how to communicate why we want to be at higher inflation. So when Mick said, gee, this is gonna be hard because you're gonna to have to have uh, 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 low rates for longer and that's gonna somehow try to convince people that eventually we're gonna have higher inflation. And a quick anecdote on this, uh, and this will reveal my age in case you couldn't tell it from my hair color. But I remember in the early 1990s when Gordon Thiessen, the governor of the Bank of Canada, was on a CBC radio show with a guy named Peter Zosky. And anybody on this call that's my age knows who I'm talking about. But uh, Gordon Thiessen was trying to explain why they needed to raise interest rates in order to then lower inflation and lower interest rates. Gordon Thiessen was a pretty good communicator, and that was a pretty tough, uh, tough assignment to explain on CBC radio how that worked. And so this one, Mick says, is kind of the opposite. How do we explain that we have to lower interest rates for longer in order to then actually raise inflation and raise interest rates? Um, now, David Andolfato says we don't have to do that. We'll just actually unleash the fiscal authorities and we'll get the inflation. So, so maybe that's right. But uh, I guess I'd like your thoughts on that, how we communicate, how we get there. But the second question is, how do we, what's the, what's the kind of punchline bumper sticker explanation for why we want higher inflation? Uh, because I think there's a lot of people out there, maybe they're old, maybe they are on fixed incomes, but there's a lot of people who actually think it's a little puzzling why the Bank of Canada is targeting already a 2% inflation target. And they kind of want to pound their hands on the table and say, wow, why, isn't the, why aren't the authorities aiming for ab absolute stability in the value of my money? So what is the, what's the quick, as I said, sort of bumper sticker explanation for why we would benefit from higher inflation? Well, um, I, I, I like the justifications a bank uses on their website to, in their public education documents, but uh, the simplest and I think the least controversial one would be that often we mismeasure CPI, uh, mismeasure, have a room to mismeasure inflation. And by pr pr pursuing 2%, we avoid situations where actually inflation could be zero or negative. Um, so it just gives us a bit more buffer room. 2% also um, allows for a bit of um, more real wage flexibility when nominal wage contracts are, um, are fixed. Um, I don't know if Mick wants to add anything to that. But then I would jump in and say, well, if 2% is, if the 2% target kind of allows for that stuff, then why do we need three or four? What's the... Because it's hard to explain your model and your experimental outcomes on CBC radio. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, I, I, I hate to say that, or use the justification that, look, we've got a lot of households who are heavily indebted and raising rates or raising inflation would help to reduce their debt burden because lenders would very quickly learn this and very quickly adjust rates upward when having the opportunity to negotiate. So um, I don't find that a good explanation, but I see it as um, inevitable that we're going to be having more inflation just given all the m money that's already in the system. And so as a result, um, raising the target would just help to improve that, that credibility of the bank. So maybe I'll uh, <laughs> could talk about bumper stickers. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, what Lubis says is, is is exactly right, and I think it's you know it's um, exactly the 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 right kind of answer, uh, logical and academic answer. But I think it, it again, it's it's kind of hard to argue. Uh, I mean, Chris makes a good point that you know pensioners and other people on on fixed incomes and lots of people think, well, why do prices have to go up all the time? So it's hard to know what, what the bumper sticker uh, explanation would be. I would be inclined to just say, we need more firepower. You know, we need to be able to respond to negative shocks. If interest rates are a quarter percent, we can't do that. Just explain that. I mean, I think maybe the, the public would, would understand that a, a little bit more. Um, I do kind of question the issue about whether we're going to see a bunch more inflation um, down the road uh, because of these these fiscal excesses. I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe, but the evidence from Japan, uh, despite what what uh, David Antipano said, the evidence is. I mean, Japan has been printing money massively for you know 15 years, and we haven't seen inflation tick up at all. So it's hard to know. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to just. If, do you have time for one last response? Oh, I just want to say about. Um, why and how do we communicate this to the public, um, this higher inflation target? Um, I, I don't know if it's so important to convey that interest rates will be going up in the future. I think if anything that might incur, that might uh, have a potential of making uh, households a bit anxious of getting invested in anything in, in, into any long-term debt. Um, but just conveying that those interest rates stay low for a while would be effective. I don't know how much I'd emphasize the future rates. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everybody. That's we're, that's we're almost exactly on time, a bit early. Um, this is exactly the kind of uh, um, debate that I wanted to see, and uh, especially the uh, um, the notion that at some point um, we are going to have, you know, any kind of new uh, mandate would have to be sold to the public, and this is going to be something that uh, we're going to, you know, certainly academics perhaps don't really think too hard about this, but it, you know, bumper sticker slogans are going to be the, the kind of thing that we're going to probably just start thinking about. Okay, um, we're going to, the, the next break, the, um, we're going to have a break starting at 2.30. The, um, the, uh, the coffee break hosts, uh, Angela Molino, I believe, are already there. The links are, you should, be, you should see them in the chat uh, box on the side, and uh, you, you're in, you, there's two separate links, one for, one for Angelo's, one for Nick's. You can stay here. Everyone will uh, be free to unmute uh, and, and chat in this main room. And um, so we're, you're also going to be seeing these links in your, in your earning many email. If you, don't, if you can't see for some reason the, chat, the links in the chat box, um, these are the same links that were in the mail that you got this morning. Uh, there's also the link for session two, which starts at three. It's a separate link. You have to uh, uh, log out of this session. This session uh, is going to just be, uh, it's going to be just like an empty conference room for people to hang out. Uh, the new session will start at three o'clock in a different link. Um, and the links are on the, um, uh, are on the chat box and in your emails. So uh, it's 2.30. I'm going to declare this session closed. Thank you very much, everybody. This is exactly what I hoped for. <laughs>